好，大家好，呃，我是严光啊，呃，英文叫 David， 呃，我是青年 ACP 的会长，呃 ，ACP 呢，呃，还有些人不知道，呃，刚才啊是 stand for Associate for Chinese Professional， 啊、呃，就是 ACP， 是这当地就是达布地区哈，最早成立一家为中国人服务的华侨服务的那个组织。呃，成立一九一三，呃，一九九三年那个时候，对，后来先去成立像商会啊，还有其他的组织，所以呃 ，ACP 在这个地方会员是最多，然后历史最悠久。我们主要做什么呢？主要是帮助 professional， 呃，成人呢，做一些，比如说那个职业培训啊，还有做一些那个创新创业啊，呃，做一些 startup 啊，还有做一些投资这样的，呃，咨询啊，讲座这样的。呃，小孩呢，我们有做机器人啊，有做数学、汉语，就是协助一些这个竞赛啊，这样的，帮助小孩升学呀，帮助教育讲座啊，这样这样的。呃，总的就是服务于我们侨社嘛，反正有利侨社我们都做，就这样。呃，国立的呢，我们就少做啊。呃，今天啊，我们改变一下我们那个以往飞马逃课，飞马逃课是在。呃，一年一年半以前，我们 A C P 刚开的一个新的项目，就是说鼓励我们的在职人员来出来创新创新创业，就是鼓励创业。然后呢，是一个商务形式的，每每个月有一期，甚至两期，就这样。嗯、呃，就是在这个沙龙呢，我们想掏出一些新的 idea 或者是新的观观念，然后鼓励大家呢，然后往下走，就这样。呃，今天呢，我们特意请来了就是两位，呃，就是是属于小朋友，就这样。为什么呢？因为我们以前都请的大人，呃，就是呃比较成功的人士吧。今天呢，就请来了是两位，在未来有可能他们会是比较成功的，因为可以从他们自己的轨迹啊、做的事情啊，已经都很不错了。所以，我们就想鼓励我们的高中生、大学大学生啊，他们来这个。从这个创业这个角度来开发他们的思维，就这样。然后我们请两位，一一位叫贝尼岩，一位叫铁木梦。哎，今天的这个我们活动呢，不是由我来主持，是我们专门请来了我们几位大侠。呃，我们有请那个苏林先生来今天为我们做主持。呃，在这个前呢，我先把那个苏林先生介绍一下啊。嗯。苏总呢，他是这个现在是在 Reliance j i l 高级技术服务主管啊、呃，他是这个领导这个一支团队呢，专注于呃有限和云云网络的新兴技术的开发和架构设计，还担任了 ONAP 还有 TSC 的成员，并参与了多项啊、呃、开源计划。在加入 j i l 之前呢，呃，苏明是在这个 v e n t u r System。做首席执行呃兼这个联合创始人，呃，该公司一一是一家软件开发公司，专为全球一级运营商 s d n 和 FTV 技术终端呃开发呃云的基础构架解决方案和云的商业运营。呃，苏宁还是自一九零八年以来哈、啊，这个呃通。通信行业的 s d n 和这个 NFA 革命先驱，呃，思想领袖和主要贡献者之一，包括呃概念指引，用于呃列定义，还有那个框架建的建立和需求改进，一直到双商业案例的提案，还有技术开发，还有技术实验室的试验。他是 N F V 和 S N S D N 世界大会的顾问小组成员，他拥有四十项专利，还专利呃还专利申请。他非常活跃的是一位非常活跃的研究者，长期担任技术委员会成员，并呃偶尔组织工业呃组织工业和技术会议，如年度的 M L T L S。L S 和那个 S N D 的 S D N 的会议 ，M L S P S 和以以太网世界大会，还有 I P 会议的网络和云计算的会议，他还是德克萨斯大学达拉斯分校 Eric Johnson 呃工程学院和计算机学院的行业顾问呃
委员会成员。下面也有请啊，苏、呃、林先生，我们组织今天的活动。Uh, it's great to see so many youngsters here and some old friends. Uh, since there are so many youngsters here, I will switch to English. Uh, if uh, we have any communication problems, you can let me know. I can do a, a bilingual translation. Um, it's an honor to be your host for the Flying Forces talk tonight. We have two distinguished speakers. Uh, they are very young, and but they, as David just put it, they will have some very bright future, and some of them are already doing great. Um, the first speaker is uh, Kevin Meng. So let me give you a, a brief introduction of Kevin is a senior at uh, Plano West High, so uh, will be 12th grade coming up. And he has already won multiple national and international awards, and uh, he has uh, uh, several innovative research projects. And one of the very uh, prestigious award, that is uh, Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, uh, his project has won the best of category for 2019. And that, that is, if you know that uh, ISEF is uh, one of the uh, top international award for upcoming next generation scientists and researchers. And also, I personally find it very cool that MIT recently named a planet after him. So that is a very, very rare honor. And uh, um, he is going to give a talk tonight about looking soon war with artificial intelligence. So tonight, we will have uh, such a format is we will have a uh, talk, we will have two talks, and Kevin will give the first talk, and then Benny will give the second talk. And after each talk, we will have two uh, distinguished commentators and give uh, a, a critique and comment about their research, about their um, speech, and then we will open up the floor for uh, questions, Q&A. Uh, the Q&A will be about 15 minutes, and then we will have the second speaker come up again. So, without further ado, let me give uh, the floor to Kevin. Hey, good afternoon. Good evening, actually, it should be. Uh, how's everyone doing? Good. Good. Great. Yeah, so, um, as the title suggests, today I'm going to be talking about my recent project, which is about looking through walls with artificial intelligence. Now, if you've seen the movies, right, you've read the books, you've played the games, you've, you've um, in lots of, in a lot of areas of popular culture, you see this idea of being able to see what people are doing even though you can't see them with your eyes. And so that's what we're gonna be tackling in this project. So the idea is that instead of using visible light, we're gonna look at it a different way from a really different perspective. Usually we think of radio frequency waves as a communication wave, right? Our cellular, our Wi-Fi, they all run on, on, on RF. And so that's our communication wave. But today we're going to take a look at RF from a different perspective, which is using it as an imaging wave, which means sending these RF signals, capturing the reflections, and then analyzing whatever you see in the reflections to, to kind of to outline an image. So let's get started. Um, Officially, or, or more formally, the goal is to establish a methodology that can convert radio frequency images into a human figure by using artificial intelligence so that we can see human figures even through obstruction. So what I mean by a human figure is this 15-point human skeleton. It's simply a skeleton. It marks out all the important key points on your human body, like your head, your shoulders, etc. And it moves around. It's joined together by sticks, and it's a skeleton that moves. So a brief roadmap of what happens is that you have a radio frequency transceiver which is able to send and receive Wi-Fi signals, and some of these signals get absorbed or reflected by the wall, but some of them also pass through, and then after they pass through, they hit the human, they reflect back, and then you gather an image. But this image is actually quite difficult to understand just because of the drawbacks of radio frequency, because everything is a trade-off. Radio frequency has great penetrative power, but there are also some, some downsides to using it. So to overcome all these problems, we're going to be using artificial intelligence. 
a couple goals for the project. Uh, let, let's just say that they are fourfold. Number one, we wanted to be able to handle different obstruction structures, for example, a drywall or whatever that kind of wall is made of, or et cetera, right? So you want this to be able to generalize to different environments. Second, to process multiple people, because typically there aren't just one person in a scene. Third, we wanted to execute in real time, so, um, so that we don't have to record these radio frequency videos and then process them on a computer offline. We want an online running. And then finally, we have some safety and health considerations. This one is not as pronounced, but uh, we still consider it because radio frequency signals, they're all those like fear monitoring, Wi Fi can damage your brain cells. Um, but we transmit at 1 1,000th of the power of Wi Fi, so totally FCC compliant, and there's no real big consideration or, or health, health risk there. And then finally, after we establish these goals, we take a look at related works. So this has been a problem that is that has recently kind of burst onto the mainstream. It's been it's been a research topic of interest for about ten years now. Uh, places like MIT they've investigated this about ten years ago. They started looking at how do we accustom how do we repurpose these Wi-Fi transceivers to be image imaging devices, and then. In, in 2015, actually, they started looking at algorithms to use um, to use rule-based algorithms to stitch together the different body parts. And I'll get into exactly why we need to be stitching body parts together in a second, but they were using rule-based algorithms that could not generalize to different environments and also the strange behavior that you see with RF signals at times. And also, MIT actually recently re uh, released this work called RF Pose. It is a, it is a, it is a model that uses machine learning, deep learning namely, to reconstruct poses from images. But it has a big flaw in it that we'll get into a little bit later, and that is it is a one-to-one -one system, which means one set of, of reflections equals one output image, which is not what we're going to be doing in this project. So we'll get into exactly what that means in a second. Now some materials, this one really isn't that interesting. We have some programming languages, some software tools, um, some frameworks and packages, just the typical things that you would see in any kind of deep learning project. I guess the notable stuff would be, number one, the device sensors. We're going to be using a radio frequency transceiver, and I don't have my phone on me, but it's literally the size of a cell phone, a typical large, like for example, an S10 or a large iPhone. And it has 18 transmitters and receivers, there are antennas, and it is able to, it of course transmits with the FCC compliance, and it transmits a little bit above the 2.4 gigahertz band of Wi-Fi, a little bit above 3.3 to 10, um, to avoid messing with that frequency. And then finally, because of the way that these these signal these um, these antenna arrays work, they image on these spherical coordinate systems. So this is the setup that we use. You notice that here's the RF antenna array, and here's a camera. You might think, hey, what's what's the deal, right? Because cameras don't see through walls. But we'll get into exactly why this is important because it's going to play a nice, uh, play a nice role in the trick that we use. And then, so finally, we co-locate these sensors. So they they send and receive signals. Well, the camera just collects ambient light, but um, they collect information at the same time. So at each given moment in time, you have two representations of a person: their radio frequency image and also their RGB color image. So here's a little bit about data acquisition. First of all, just to clarify why we're using radio frequency signals. Um, if you just consider the EM spectrum, we have visible light, which we traditionally see with. Uh, but visible light, as well as IR, which is very close to it on the spectrum, they don't penetrate walls. And that defeats the whole purpose of our work. So we're going to go with a little bit of a longer wavelength. Now, um, if, you're, if you're familiar with the recent developments in, for example, self-driving cars, they use millimeter wave frequency. Uh, waves to image their surroundings. Now these MM waves, they're extremely, they're, they're very high detail compared to RF waves when you use them for imaging, but they still don't go through walls. They don't even go through a cloth, actually. I, um, I, uh, I had a friend, uh, uh, my friend's dad, who works, at, who works with TI chips, and he had a, just like a regular cloth that you would use to clean your kitchen table, and the MM wave couldn't penetrate that. So we're going to use RF because it has a nice trade-off between um, penetrative capability and also resolution, because as you know, the longer your wavelength is, the lower your resolution is going to come out to be. So once you have this, and you also have the radio frequency antenna array, what you can do is you can call this API that, uh, that, that calls this hardware device to send and receive these Wi-Fi signals, 
and we get this. We get sort of this 3D distribution of, of, of numbers. Now these numbers, they represent the reflection power from all of the voxels in the space around you. So I intentionally left out the details of how it computes, how far you are and where you are in relation to it, but the idea is that it has this kind of information. Uh, and the reason I left that out is because this is not exactly a technical talk. Um, so the idea that you just have to grasp is that if I'm the transceiver, I can see exactly where people are and how far they are in front of me. And this information is collected in CSV files, and then of course we also have the camera that's recording video, RGB, uh, just MP4 format. So remember that we, we collect this 3D distribution, and both of these axes, well all three of these dimensions are very important to us. First of all, uh, where exactly is it coming from, from this plane in front of me, left, right, up, down. And also I want to know how far it is. But the problem with 3D is that we're going to be computing not only over three dimensions, but also plus time, so four dimensions. And as you know, if you just, um, the computational complexity just gets very poor from up there. So um, you won't be able to run this in real time if you try to process over four dimensions. So we use a nice trick. We actually just simplify this 3D information into two 2D heat maps. Essentially, the idea is if you imagine, like, for example, this projector is like a flashlight and it's shining on you and behind you, you can see the shadow. That's the idea. You sum it, you just take, like, you just have an imaginary plane and then you sum all the values and that's the heat map back there. And then the other, on the other dimension, to pre preserve the information about where I am in front of this, is if you have, for example, a flashlight up and it's shining down on you and the floor is the image, then you know where I am. Am I close? Am I far? Am I to the left or to the right? So of course we still retain this 3D information, but we also have it now in two dimensions, which is, ex which is a lot better, right? So that's one of the considerations that we make. So now that we have two 2D heat maps, if you're curious, this is what they kind of look like. This is the vertical heat map, and we'll get into why it looks so strange and incomplete. Um, but these are the heat maps that are going in. So now we have a couple of challenges that we want to come back to that involve exactly why we need artificial intelligence in this project, right? Because if it's so straightforward, we have an image and there's our person. So there's this problem, the biggest problem that we deal with in addition to these other challenges like low resolution imaging and multi-person support is this problem that people have coined as specularity. So the idea is that visible light, right? It's, it's in the hundreds of nanometers of a wavelength range. Um, but radio frequency waves, they're about five centimeters long. So many, many times uh, longer radio frequency signals are. And what, what actually happens is that when, when these radio frequency signals, they hit you, they may not go back to the receiver. Because visible light is when it hits surfaces, the surface acts as a scatter. This light energy goes out in many different directions, and that's why we can see things from different perspectives. But radio frequency signals, they act a little less nicely. When you, when you hit a surface, it actually just follows the law of reflection and then it reflects off in the other direction. So for example, if a wave hits the floor, it goes out in that direction. And if your transceiver is right here, that means the wave doesn't come back to the transceiver. And what does that mean? It's invisible, right? So that's what you're seeing here. Invisibility of the head, invisibility of some of the legs, and invisibility of some of these feet. <coughs> So I know that this concept may be very abstract appearing and it might be very unintuitive, but I have a video that maybe some of you can relate to. If you've ever looked at an ultrasound, which I can't claim to having, but my dad back there, he has. <laughs> this is what an ultrasound looks like. Notice how the baby's head kind of goes in and out of focus. It disappears and then reappears. That's, the, that's, the, that's a similar principle that we're looking at. Even though these are sound waves and we're talking about EM waves, a similar principle holds and you see that you see that this this uh, this head is not always visible. So maybe you maybe maybe you're thinking, you know, we only sample. For example, if I just have this video here, I just pause it at a certain moment, right there. You can kind of see the head, not really, but where are the arms, right? But then you allow time to pass. Let me just double click, and then, okay, you you kind of see, you kind of get the point, right? Instead of just sampling one 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 go of reflections. Maybe sample more than one. Maybe accumulate information over time so that we can retrieve a more complete pose because of the physical properties of RF. So that's actually the key thing behind our project. The main thing is that we're going to approach radio frequency imaging as a many-to-many -many problem instead of one-to-one. -one. In the optical system, because everything or most things in our environment are, are scatters, we only need one go of reflections to see everything. But the problem is radio frequency doesn't work that way. So we can't just say one-to-one 
for every frame of output that we produce, we have to consider multiple frames of input. And that's really the key here, many to many. So as far as how that's implemented, that's where the deep learning comes in, and that's kind of the motivation. That we have to take in these, these, these strange looking heat maps that may not be complete, and then make them complete by considering more, more frames of information, and you have to find some kind of modeling solution that can accomplish this accumulation. So this is a picture, I'm completely aware that you may not be able to see what it, what's going on, but let me just walk you through it. Um, so these are the radio frequency images that are going in, and they pass through three primary processing components. Number one, a convolutional neural network, second, a region proposal network, and third, a recurrent neural network. So, of course, again, this is not a technical talk, so I'll go through each of these very briefly. Number one is CNN, um, very standard method of taking a look at the image, uh, these images, and, and extracting the pertinent pieces of information. They're encoded in a very nice way. So for example, the CNN would look at, hey, where are the arms, where are the legs, if there are any, and it would output representations of this and say, okay, so there they are. So that's the convolutional neural network. Second, we have a region proposal network, which says, hey, maybe there are multiple people in the frame, and if so, where are these people? So it would draw bounding boxes around these people and then, and then pass that to the next processing component. And then finally, third is where the many to many comes in. It's a long short-term memory network that, in, that it incorporates information not only from the current frame to produce the output, but also multiple frames in advance. And we set this, we set this accumulation frame size to five. So for every output that you produce, you have to consider not just t equals, I mean time t, but also time t minus uh, from, from five seconds ago, or five frames ago, which is one second, because we're sampling at five hertz. So that's the main, that's, that's it. That's the main, that, that's the main modeling solution that we're going to have. We're going to accumulate over time in order to uh, make a more complete pose. So next we reach an interesting problem. And with, as with any machine learning model, you have to teach it to do its job, as with any human as well. Uh, but there's no publicly available data set. If you've done, like, for example, handwritten digit classification or like image classification, you have many, many people that are online labeling all these things and they publish these millions of size data sets for all of you to use. Uh, but that's sadly not the case here. So we have two options here. Number one, you go out and you spend hours and hours of time and you, you label millions and millions of data points and you create a very small size data set. Or you can have a teacher do it for you. And no, I don't mean a, a sort of a human teacher, I mean a computing teacher. So that's the, that's the trick that I was mentioning earlier that requires the camera. So let's take a look at how this might work. So remember that the webcam and the radio frequency image, the antenna array, were collecting information all at the same time. So you have two representations of the person. Let's call this guy Joe. Joe has a camera image here and also a radio frequency uh, rendition over here. So we pass this, uh, this color image to a teacher. And the teacher is already very, very good. It's already gone through university. It already knows how to convert all of these radio, uh, no, sorry, these color images into a highly accurate pose right here. Now this pose is so accurate and so complete that we treat it as the ground truth, or the correct answer that the teacher provides for the student. So when the student sees the radio frequency image and it does its processing and it produces its prediction, it can then say, hey, my, te my teacher was very, it produced a different answer than I did, and usually I'm wrong. So the teacher, the teacher gives its ground truth, correct answer to the student, and then the student learns to correct its mistakes using that propagation. So that's essentially how it works. That is how we're able to, to, to avoid having to label millions and millions of data points and ask a computer to do all the work for us. So this is a more detailed talk, I mean, this is a more detailed overview of that process I just described earlier, but I think the only thing that merits further explanation is the, uh, is the way by which we add a little bit of extra noise. So you might, you might, you might look at this, this, training, this training diagram and think, wait, Kevin, like, uh, don't you have um, cameras? And cameras, they don't go through walls. So how can you teach something to look through walls? So what we do here is we actually just introduce this stand. This stand um, is so just supposed to emulate whatever it's supposed to see through, like, for example, a wall or a fabric wall or a paperboard or whatever. And so we set this stand up such that it blocks the radio frequency uh, antenna array, and through this you can, you can simulate the reflection or the attenuation that these waves go through when they hit. 
but you don't block the camera. It's actually a very simple idea, but it, it really helps improve the robustness of your model because you're able to intentionally train it to see through walls rather than have it become an accident. And then finally, yes, this is a data set. It involves different things like walking, gesturing, sitting, multi-person, et cetera. So finally, after this teacher is able to teach the student, it's able to, the student is now able to independently of the teacher take in these radio frequency images and then produce them a, a very, very, very accurate pose. So now I have a couple of videos for you all. This isn't working in action. These are the radio frequency signals going in, and this is the pose that's coming out. This is a 15 centimeter thick drywall just on my ho at my house. And uh, as you can see, the pose here is being reconstructed through the wall. Yeah, my friends make fun of me for the poses that make. Okay, so we can put this up later when we have questions, but uh, I want to talk about one more thing, and that's running this in real time. Remember, that was one of our goals. And I would presume that <coughs> our goal does not include having this uh, large GPU server on our back. So we need a mobile system, but these computations cannot be performed on a mobile system. So the idea is that we, uh, we use the internet. Uh, we use the internet because the information that this radio frequency antenna rate collects really isn't that large. It is a... Uh, uh, it's not very large at all. So we can use the internet to send this information over to a GPU server, and then it does the computations out there, and then it sends it back to the Raspberry Pi, which is our computer, our mini computer in this case. And as you can see, that's what happens. There's this, uh, these sensors are feeding data to here, you send it over, it processes, and then you send it back, and there's a smartphone here that can do the processing. So this is a video of that working. Uh, this was filmed in Phoenix the night before the competition because I realized that they banned Wi-Fi in the exhibit hall. So as you can see, there's this. Uh, I'm, I'm working. Up, I'm, run, I'm walking up here, and there's this pose output that's coming out of the. That's coming out of the. That's coming out of this smartphone display. Yeah, so I know I'm running up on my 30 minutes, so with that, I wanted to cover a couple of applications that I think are, are, are pretty exciting. Now, full disclaimer, this thing is no radio production quality yet. It's really just a proof of concept. But I think that if this were to be developed through some of the future work that I want to mention later, this could have some pretty, really, really exciting applications. But first of all, that may not be completely intuitive, because when you think of seeing through walls, you just think spying, or like law enforcement, or military. But this was actually one of the, uh, one of the, one of the kind of inspirations for this project as well, and that is non-invasive healthcare monitoring. Uh, you know, when you want to make sure that your mom, who is maybe aging, is safe, or your grandparents for that matter, you put up a camera, right? And that's what my, my grandparents, my aunt and uncle did. And the uh, problem was that she walked into a dead zone. You walk behind a wall and the camera doesn't go through, so now we say, okay, well maybe we can see through walls. So this can eliminate that problem of dead zones. And sometimes if you think about it, we have dead zones there for a reason, right? There's a reason there are no cameras in your bathroom, because you don't want people to be able to, to have the potential to maliciously access this. Um, but the thing with our, with our technology is that it produces just 15 key points, and you may be okay with that. So it's a little bit of a, a privacy-preserving tactic. And then finally, of course, is uh, that we still get these key points, and we see them moving around, and this could potentially be able to uh, be applied through some other modeling solution or other predictive measure to analyze your gait. And gait can be used for a lot of things, like for example, fingerprinting or even, uh, I mean, even detection of degenerative diseases like Parkinson's because they walk in a very specific way that you could tell. So that's one of the first exciting applications. The second is fire search and rescue. I actually did a little bit of research. This was a study conducted a couple years ago. And they set up a gateway <coughs> node and a leaf node. They communicate through Wi-Fi or a similar band. And they put a fire in the middle, and they thought, hey, does this fire really, does it impact the link quality? And what they found was not significant. And uh, I think that's really interesting. So the implication of this is that we can solve a problem that potentially I don't think has been solved before, and that's looking through fire. Um, looking through fire in these situations could possibly help first responders locate all these people from safety without having to go. And then finally, of course, the, the, the military operations thing. This is the 1978 film Robocop, 1987. 
Uh, you see that there's a, there's a terrorist here, and then he's looking through this thing allegedly called the thermograph, but we know that since IR doesn't go through walls, that doesn't work. But uh, the idea is cool, right? This premise of busting through the wall and saving the hostages has always been sort of a dream. So, on that note, thank you all for your time. I'll open the question. I'll open the floor to questions. have a commentator first for you and then uh, open up for the, the floor for the questions. And this is uh, wonderful research. Um, I'm leading several teams doing uh, 5G uh, research right now. As uh, going through this uh, presentation, I can see uh, many similar challenges, technical challenges, applications, use cases that uh, the entire industry and many academic institutions around the world are actively working in this area. Um, so the, uh, the, the, uh, the you, you will see many, uh, and as I'm seeing what uh, applications are being developed using 5G, you will see many of those things happening very soon. And uh, many brilliant work. And I don't think you need it, but ever you need one, uh, you need an intern, you have a standing off from my team. Um, next, we will give to uh, two commentators. We have two esteemed uh, uh, professionals. Uh, I will do a quick introduction for both to uh, have a comment on the uh, speech and talk that Kevin just gave. Uh, first is Dr. Zhang Li. And Dr. Li started her career as a professor years ago and uh, later joined HP as an electrical engineer and uh, eventually become a uh, product marketing manager and R&D manager. <laughs> Dr. Li also founded uh, Five Star Speech, uh, helping youth to develop their communication and uh, public speaking skill. And the second commentator is Dr. TJ Xia. And TJ is a long-term uh, friend of mine and colleague. Um, he uh, worked for Verizon. And he is a technical expert in the optical communication area. And he is a true innovator with over 80 patents. And Dr. Xia is also the author of the book, How to Inspire Outstanding Ideas, All You Need to Know to Create Amazing Solutions. And you can buy the book from Amazon now. So uh, we will have uh, Dr. Li and uh, Dr. Xia here to provide the uh, comments about the talk. Clearly, they're not going to remember anything. 
Then, make it that simple, make it easy to follow, make it interesting, and when you look at this, it sounds really, really not that hard, but pretty simple, right? However, it's extremely hard to do. Probably should know that, right? Extremely hard to do. You first start with generating a PowerPoint files for Google Doc. Use large thumb. Haven't started. Use wood. Use chart or diagrams to what? To have your message or direct to reduce the number of words on um, that precious screen real estate. Take words off as much as you can, as direct as you can. And use phrases, avoid the sentences, and absolutely no paragraphs. Those are very, very important. And obviously, check, and then check. And check again because you know, from a my point of view, my professional life is largely based on writing documents and making presentations, introducing product, and also making presentations to show users something and then teach them something. And uh, I beat myself really, really hard to check my spelling, for example. Because clearly, look at that face. English is a second language. <laughs> but, however, every time that I put that <coughs> on the screen, I will find some things not right. Every time. And this is also important for the student here, as well as for some of our engineers you know, who work in work. Unless it's absolutely need, don't make it too fancy. Because I've seen plenty of student presentations, somehow, they just like that, you know, cartoon. They like that waving flag. Even if it's completely irrelevant, they just want to be fancy. And then it was just everything to go down like that. Unless, and for, because this, can take your presentation away from somewhere you want that to be. Okay, that's very, very important. I once had a student just, oh, I just want that way to play. Why? Because it's cool. So what do you want to do? And I was, is that cool to be cool the reason why you are making this presentation? No, but I still want that to be cool. Well, it's just, you know, that, don't make that too fancy, otherwise it looks unprofessional for us at work. Part two is making presentations. This is where Kevin did an extremely good job. And loud and clear, not too fast. Because being too slow, I just don't typically see that. Being too fast is a problem. And use a pointer, obviously I follow my friend Kevin. And for student, okay, for student, especially for middle school student, do not put everything else on that screen and then turn your back towards your audience and start reading that word for word. And I see that a lot. Don't read it all. And then we come to questions and then practice, 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 practice and make it perfect. Right? Those are important. And uh, once again, those things look simple. And I've seen plenty of people make mistakes here, and it's very, very hard to correct. Once that's what you used to do. I took this presentation. Out of the typical type of presentations, I see a combination of inform as well as inspired from mm -hmm. Kevin's presentation. That's what I see. I didn't demonstrate, I'm not ready. 
even though it's not powerful, but I do see these vibrations and motivations there. And presenters have projected the confidence extremely well. He did a good presentation, he explained that very, very complicated project almost single-handedly without any help from his PPT file. Without not much help from the PPT file. Because those words are too small, it's very hard to see. So you have to have a lot of uh, strong uh, things in your presentation to overcome what your PPT file cannot help you. You are single-handedly you know, doing that. And uh, overall, very, very impressive. If the goal for the organization for today's event is to provide information as well as to inspire, we should accomplish. If that's, that's what I felt. If that's your goal too, good job. Kevin, presentation, considering that the slides developed mainly for science fair competition, therefore, it's not to be made short or straight to the point. It's not the goal. Considering also that he is a basic student, does not have time to modify his slide about for today's event, neither is that expected by the organizer. Also considering that the whole lot is not a whole lot is writing on the outcome of today's presentation. Because today's presentation, you are successful at this level, reach that level of success, and not getting much out of that. It's not like somebody with a big pocket of money there and they understand that they will get a two million dollars worth, right? Considering also that, therefore we did a good job today. But any of those assumptions are not true, <coughs> there's a lot of room for you to prove that. Okay, Kevin? The main takeaway for me from Kevin's presentation is, oh, Kevin's science fair, present, science fair work is AI-based. Now I know it. That is something see-through wall. Complicated things, but oh yeah, I remember that. And also, now I see after this presentation, I will see oh, this is what it takes. I mean, the breadth of knowledge and the depths of the work. This is what it takes to be successful at that level. And also, when I walk away, I would be thinking. Do I have that in me? If I'm a student, uh, if I'm a parent, does my kid have that in him right? or her? And then, if not, how close am I? Do I even want to follow that step? Or go back to practice my piano, right? right? Whatever, right? Just so that I, those are the things that stick on my mind when I leave. Not the technical details, however, even though uh, I, my, type of, my type of engineering, I do understand. Other than the AI part, the antenna, <coughs> the sensor part, I do that because my major is electromagnetics. I do understand that. Antenna, with lens, penetrating, or not, reflection, scattering, all that stuff. But if considering general public, this would be what I take away from. And uh, with that, that is extremely important things that I have worked with. However, since no one is ever perfect in Kevin, there's an overwhelming amount of information, words are too small to read, the context of the tool you have technical, and the stuff you show certainly is clearly needed more than 30 minutes. Therefore, uh, more than 50% of the time, I'm because I have to listen to you intently, and the your PPT bar is not happening at all. About half of the time. And all be 
because of the bottom line is this slide is just not credited for presentation. It's for science fair. You need to put that in the details there. Then, looks like there's no solution, right? What do we do? Ideally, PPT file needs to be developed in main for this event to maximize the subject understanding, use a large file, and reduce simplified the content. What? Just, she just doesn't have the time for that. And if we require that, we will not have this talk, right? Therefore, is all that considered? This is my suggestion. First, use science fair PPT file. Use that. Then, add a top level up line at the start, right after your cover page. And add a top level summary at the end. For it only. So give people a flow what you want to do. And then, when you start, start the presentation, explain that this is created for science fair, not in the best shape for today's meeting. Just apologize for that. It's top friend. You know it is not, right? And then, and also mention that you wish you could modify that for today's event, however, that is not practical at this point. And you will do your best to make audience understand the content. And once you put that up for it, and then they don't, they would know what to expect already. That's all. All right. I don't have slides. And. Uh, um, but I, what I take from uh, Kevin's talk is uh, normally I look at the, anybody's talk is one. Uh, what's a fee? Right. So first you need to let everybody knows what's a theme on the talk. So this part is good. And then you also need to know what's the object of the talk. Right. Then you have to expand the content of a flow and explain from beginning what's the goal and uh, how do I, you know, how did I do it and uh, what's the approach and what method I'm going to use and then uh, you get a conclusion and you demo with the video clips and all those parts Kevin did a very good job now if I ask anything I'd like to add on a um, couple of things. Some some comments that overlap with Dr. E said. And the one is I'd like you to add because it's a research project, right? So I really like you to add a part saying in this field so far, uh, what have you done? And uh, uh, in which you know uh, institute of which group and what I'm going to do and what's the differentiation what's a major new trick tricks or new approaches I'm going to use it right so that will give the whole audience a very fresh start point say oh I'm going to look at something new right that's that's the key of the information of the innovation right and the second part is, um, yeah, the font is really, you know, should be much larger. And uh, also, you need to tailor this for different audience. Okay. So maybe you should cut down the two technical, you know, content for this audience and uh, make the font larger and uh, use more pictures to make the audience, you know, much easier to, to uh, absorb what you're trying to say, what you're trying to convey. And the uh, last piece i like to, you, you, you talked about a lot of applications. The value of all the research is applications, right? So I'd like to see, probably not now, but in the future, 
you add some real case, like you say, you know, fire emergency. Yeah. Maybe work with the fire department to get some, you know, real real case and put there. That would be very powerful. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Lee and uh, Dr. Xia. Great commentaries. Now we open the floor for Q and A, and Kevin's here. All right. We have a question for Kevin. Uh, I know, as a senior, as a senior student, uh, like, uh, my first son already experienced the last year is very very busy. So how can you uh, still uh, find time to uh, to do research? Do you uh, uh, participate in like, uh, other activities like events in the school or like these kind of activities? So how, how do you manage your time? So usually the solution is to slack off the school. <laughs> uh, I, I say that as a joke. Um, so I guess it's just trying to, for me at least, I don't necessarily recommend this for everyone. And it's just trying to squeeze all of my schoolwork into like a very small chunk of time. And the thing about this project was that it was done at home, so there's a lot of flexibility. And that's, that, that is something that you will see with a lot of like CS projects, that you can either do them remotely or you do them at home. So there was a lot of flexibility. I was bringing my computer and I was working on it during school. I was working on it at home. And um, it was just kind of a go and see thing, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I do participate in other things. I, um, I'm in orchestra. Uh, um, I'm also in some club at school, like our AI club made that. There's also a CS club that I'm part of, and I'm also, uh, I actually just started a science for organization. And so, just, um, yeah, I mean, things are busy, but they're all things that, um, they're all things that I like to do. So, it's not that painful, at least. Thank you. All right, I'll be quick. I think it's really awesome, the, the application for firefighting. Uh, however, I have a quick question about you training a neural network to basically uh, to basically identify what would be a human in the, in the those 15 points to the human skeleton. How does a very complex building and the items within that building, and in terms of all the walls, and there's a lot of walls, how does those, how do those not affect the, the building of multiple skeletons, considering that there's probably a lot of items that could be identified or maybe trick the CNN into thinking that it is a skeleton. Great question. Uh, I'll answer that in two parts. Number one is, uh, is like, is the, the realistic aspect of being able to um, see through many, many walls and see through many, many obstru obstructions, right? So that's not something that I worked with in this work, especially because of the limitations of power. The FCC limits it to one one thousandth of power of Wi-Fi, so you really can't go through a lot of things. So I wasn't really able to test that, but I do agree with you in that if you're able, if you want to be able to use this through, for example, multiple walls or in, a, in, a, in an environment with many many objects that may not even be static, they might be moving. It's going to take a lot of work. Um, and um, as far as as far as um, what was the second part that I was going to address? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you were talking about, for example, maybe this, uh, maybe these objects in the environment can trick your model into thinking that there's a person there that, where there isn't. Uh, that's actually something that I just didn't mention in my talk, but uh, was incorporated, and that's the idea of adversarial examples. Um, and adversarial examples are just like examples of noise, and not exactly noise, but uh, signals that you won't consider humans, like for example a chair, or furniture, or all of those. Those are also incorporated into the training set. Um, actually, this idea came up in, in a session where I was just talking to um, people, and they, start, they brought up this idea of a model looking for people where there aren't really people, and I thought about it, and I thought they were correct, so I went back and added adversarial examples to uh, mitigate this. Yeah, so hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I just want to make a quick comment. I, I know this guy saw your last presentation, uh, you know, a month back. And yeah, today, right? I'm not an expert. I don't want to just kind of, you know, 
make an expert opinion, just my personal observation. I think if you, you went through you know, your problems and how you solve them, right? I think that's very helpful. And, you know, at least, you know, for this one, it's going to help people understand and help me understand the journey you went through. So I think that's a really good, you know, content in, in your presentation. Um, on the flip side, you know, I think your, well, I mean, it's not flip side, but you, your presentation was very, very small. It's a little bit too much small. So you didn't quite engage the audience. I don't know if you are aware of that. You know, because people sometimes just come didn't know what you're talking about. They just kept going. So it was just some quick comment. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I totally agree, actually. Um, I probably tried to incorporate too many details for 30 minutes. Uh, well, well, that's the thing, right? It's, it's just a good award. Yeah. Thank you for the comments. You're absolutely right. Thank you. 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 Thank Hey, uh, I'm just so curious, as a high school student, how do you do this so complex, you know, projects? There's software, there's hardware, there's sensor, everything is for me. I was working in industry for many years, still very challenging for me. How can you do that? And what kind of help and resources do you have to help you to accomplish these projects? Yeah, thank you. So something that um, something that I kind of just go by is I think my dad invented this phrase or whatever. It's standing on the shoulders of giants. Right, because to a certain extent, right? You're a high school student, and I really don't know a lot compared to all of you guys. So the idea is that you just stand on someone who who knows more than you do. Uh, because if you try to start from scratch, you start from ground zero. How far are you going to go, right? You're only so tall in your knowledge. But uh, if you build off of what other people know, and of course I had lots of help, not just um, not just the people around me, but also but also other people like uh, MIT. I had some correspondence with them. Also, other universities in the area, and even the manufacturer of this hardware device, the, the commercial, the the manufacturer. We we had some correspondence going. So, at the end of the day, I think it's just talking to people and um, reaching out. And also, to a certain degree, it's just it's just being immersed in this, right? Uh, you know, if there's a problem that you can't solve, then you just try to solve it, um, and you don't stop until you do, or you give up. Last question. Yeah, I have a couple of other questions. So, um, did you say, um, what would you I'm very interested in uh, the science fair you just attended last month, and can you uh, give us uh, some, you know, stories? You, you, how many competitors you have, and you know, uh, how the competition goes, and how do you want to? Do you have any alliances to the kids who are love science and love, you know, robotics? Do you have anything you want to say to them? I just got a free chance to plug my organization. All right, so yeah, this organization is called the Association for Young Scientists and Innovators, and the idea is that we can help we can help guide students through the science fair process. But the thing about the science fair process is that it, it has a lot of pitfalls that um, that you can fall into, and they can range from you know putting too many words on your presentation to uh, going into the interview passively replying to them. Like for example, this is just an example. Uh, you go into the interview, right? The science fair judges, they want to know what you know, and also, uh, they want to know what you know. So, some students go into these interviews reactive. They answer whatever the judge asks them, and they go on their merry way. Uh, but this is something that, for example, our organization would tell you not to do. Uh, you want to go into your interviews knowing exactly what you want the judge to know. So, you essentially, the judges all want to know the same thing, right? What you did, how you did it, and why I care. Um, so we, for example, we, 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 we tell our students that this is important and that you need to have something that you want to deliver to the judges before they even walk up to you. So that's just one of the many ways that, um, that we can help students. And uh, I think another part of that question was what exactly is science fair? Uh, well, you build this thing and then you present it. Uh, the, the, the process is um, you build a project and then you go from your school fair all the way up to the international fair through qualification stages. 
um, you have a trifold poster. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have participated in these before. Uh, you have a trifold poster, and then you present, and then you go up and up and up until um, until the competition track ends. So in this process, you actually you actually learn a lot, not just in tactical, not not just tactically, but also in in a lot of soft skills. Like for example, collaboration. Even if you may you may be an individual competitor, there's no way that you're going to get anywhere just by yourself. So collaborating with people that you may not be too familiar with, etc. Right. So there are, there are a lot of things that you can cultivate with this activity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was a wonderful talk, and uh, thank you for all the questions as well.